Hello and welcome to ATP Report. I'm Barry Nussbaum. We have a special guest today, uh, a friend of ATP and the scholar on the subject we're going to interview him on. But before we bring him on, I want to remind everybody out there in ATP land, if you haven't yet, please take out your cell phone and text the word truth in the message box. And in the address up above, send it to the number 88202 and you'll be signed up instantly for our text message alert system. You'll get this and all of our shows absolutely free on your cell phone every time we release something, including this guy who I'm going to bring on now, Robert Spencer, the founder of Jihad Watch, the showman fellow at the David Horowitz Freedom Center, the author of 23 books, and a big time book out now that we're going to talk about. Welcome, Robert. Thank you, Barry. Good to talk to you again. So real quick, before I start, tell everybody the name of your new book, and I've got questions for you from that book. The name of the book is Did Muhammad Exist? An Inquiry into Islam's Obscure Origins. This is a revised and expanded edition with a great deal of new material in it. And uh, well, I appreciate your interest in any case. Well, like we talked about before we were um, rolling today, uh, this is earth shaking stuff. And let's start with one of the big things you've come up with in the book, that there's evidence that the Quran was not actually collected and distributed in the year 653, as Islam teaches, but parts of it existed as separate books uh, that were culminated, um, or collected, I should say, 50 years later from different sources. Did I read that right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's very strange because uh, uh, it's a staple of Islamic apologetics and the case that they make in the West to non-Muslims that the Quran has always been preserved perfectly, that it has was put in its present form by the Caliph Uthman in the year 653. And the funny thing is, though, if you look back at the records that are available of people writing and speaking about the Arab conquerors in the 650s and in the 660s and 70s and 80s and 90s, you don't find any mention of a new holy book. And so it's very strange. What we're supposed to believe apparently is that Uthman uh, got together all the people who'd memorized parts of the Quran and he codified the text and burned the variants and distributed the Quran to all the provinces and then nobody mentioned it. Nobody referred to its existence, nobody quoted it, nobody said that it was there, nothing for another 50 years. We're also further supposed to believe that by the year 730 or so, 80 years after Uthman, you have John of Damascus, the Christian writer, writing about Islam and about the Quran. And he says, I've read your Quran, I've read your books, I've read the Quran, I've read Surat al-Baqarah. Now Surat al-Baqarah is the chapter of the cow, the second chapter of the Quran. So why does he refer to it as separate? You don't refer, to, you don't say I've read this book and I've also read chapter eight of it. You know, it's, it doesn't make any sense. The only way it makes sense is if Surat al-Baqarah was part of a separate book at that time. And there's also an, an anonymous writer at the same in, uh, at, from around the same period who refers to it in the same way as if it's a separate book. Uh, the only likely explanation of that is that it was a separate book at that time. Also, there's a very strange tradition of the uh, Caliph Abdul Malik, who was the leader of the Muslims from the year 685 to 705. And he says, I'm afraid I'm going to die during Ramadan because I was born during Ramadan. I became Caliph during Ramadan and I collected the Quran during Ramadan. Now, if he collected the Quran, then Uthman didn't. If Uthman collected the Quran, then Abdul Malik didn't. Now, if Uthman collected the Quran, there would be no reason for Abdul Malik to claim that he did. But if Abdul Malik collected the Quran, it's very easy to believe that to give it an air of antiquity and authenticity, he attributed the work to Uthman rather than say, this is this new thing we've just cooked up. <laughs> Sounds better to sell it. So yeah. when, you, when you look at the seventh century Arab <laughs> conquerors, um, according to Islamic tradition, as I understand it, they were all supposed to have been Muslims by then, but they didn't call themselves Muslims and they never used the word. So which is true? 
we'll see this is another problem with the standard narrative that according to Islamic tradition, according to any Islamic scholar you want to go and ask today, they would say Muhammad died in 632 and the Muslims energized by his words about waging war against unbelievers and so on, although of course a lot of Islamic scholars would like to pretend those words don't exist, but others will acknowledge they exist and say that's why they went out and conquered North Africa, the Middle East, and so on. But actually the records of the time here again, you go back to the seventh century, nobody's calling them Muslims. And there are people who write a great deal about the conquerors and about what happened and speak to the conquerors and talk to them about why they're doing what they're doing. And they never call themselves Muslims. They're never called Muslims. They never say they have a new religion. Nobody gets the idea they have a new religion or a new prophet or a new holy book. Well, there's, there's another thing that strikes me as rather interesting. Um, all of us know today, Robert, that Muslims, when they do their daily frequent prayers, face Mecca from wherever they are in the world. But that was not originally part of the religion. In fact, the practice of praying towards Mecca didn't even exist when there were mosques being built. So somewhere along the line, somebody added to the religion. Is, is that correct? Yeah, it's very strange. This is yet another indication that the standard story doesn't make any sense because in the Quran, it says the Muslims were praying toward Jerusalem and then uh, Allah gives them a different Qibla, that is the direction for prayer, and that's Mecca. And this is in chapter two of the Quran. And so it's supposed to be recorded right then within Muhammad's lifetime, the Muslims are praying toward Mecca. And yet we have in the world today, mosques that were built in the 630s, 640s, 650s, the first few decades supposedly after Muhammad supposedly died in the year 632. And so all these mosques should have the direction of prayer toward Mecca. And so one of the new things that is in the new edition of Did Muhammad Exist is I discussed the findings of a scholar named Dan Gibson who actually visited these early seventh century mosques and measured which way they point that is where their Qibla is, what direction they're facing for prayer. And he finds that the great majority of the earliest mosques face Petra, a city in Southern Jordan, which is Northwest of Mecca and North, well, in any case, North of Mecca. I don't remember right now if it's Northeast or Northwest of Mecca, but it's North of Mecca. So that it's, it's and far enough away that there's no way that you can say, well, they meant to be facing Mecca, but they're facing Petra, especially when you have mosques that are close by in Egypt and, and, and places like that, and they're very clearly facing Petra and not Mecca. So this indicates that at some point, the direction for prayer was changed, but this has no record in the Islamic texts, which have been written later to give the impression that it had always been Mecca from Muhammad's time and before that Jerusalem, and there's no mention of Petra at all. The only record of Petra comes from the record of the mosques themselves, which is enough to refute the standard traditional account. Real quick question for, for my personal edification as someone who has been uh, on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and been in the holy Islamic sites there, Dome of the Rock. Um, is it true there's no mention of Jerusalem, which had existed for 1500 years by the time um, Muhammad came around. There's no mention in any of the Quran of the place called Jerusalem. Yeah, no mention by name of Jerusalem. There is one mention in chapter 17, verse one, which is taken to be referring to Jerusalem, but there's no reason why that necessarily is so. The uh, verse in question says that Allah took Muhammad took the prophet, took the messenger, doesn't mention him my name, as I recall. Maybe there are four mentions of Muhammad in the Quran. I don't remember if that's one of them or not right now. But in any case, takes the messenger from the uh, sacred mosque to the farthest mosque. Farthest mosque in Arabic is Al-Aqsa. And so Muslims to this day, they say, well, see the Al-Aqsa mosque, it's right there on the Temple Mount. That's where Muhammad was miraculously transported. However, the, even by the standard account, that doesn't make sense because the Al-Aqsa Mosque was built in the 690s and Muhammad is supposed to have died in 632. So 
what's much more likely is that if that refers to the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, it was written much later, after Muhammad. And yes, if that, it, some years ago when I was there, uh, I had uh, a very high ranking um, Islamic tour guide who led me everywhere. This was in the days where a Jew could be there without armed guards with him. This is, goodness, 25 years ago. And he said to me, this is where Muhammad walked. This is where Muhammad was. And he went on and on and on about how this place had been blessed by Muhammad when historically, as you're saying, Robert, he was never there and there's no mention of him ever there. This is a new narrative, but they're telling everybody, including me. It comes from the Hadith. It comes from these traditions of Muhammad that are written in the 800s. So that's 200 years after Muhammad is supposed to have lived. We get this very detailed story about a winged white horse with a human head called the Burak, uh, not Barak like Obama, but Burak. And it rode uh, Muhammad to Jerusalem where at the Temple Mount, he uh, ascends into paradise and meets the prophets and meets Allah. That's the story. Even in Islamic tradition, this is just a dream because Aisha, Muhammad's favorite wife, the famous child bride, she says, he was here sleeping behind, beside me the whole time. This is in the Islamic story. So it's not a, uh, even presented as a historical incident. And that is the sole basis for the Islamic claim to Jerusalem. If the Al-Aqsa Mosque in the Quran does not refer to Jerusalem, which is likely, it only refers to where the, the farthest mosque, which is what Al-Aqsa means, that could have been anywhere. Farthest from what? I get it. So you mentioned Aisha. Now, as I get it, there's, um, what, a relative of Aisha who is uh, a source for lots of this <clears throat> story that became Islamic tradition, but is not a reliable source. What do you mean by that? Yeah, you know, that's uh, Urwa ibn Azubair. It's interesting that if you go to the Hadith collections, the ones that Muslims consider most reliable, that is Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, and so on, you go to them and you'll find a lot of the traditions are attributed to Aisha or attributed to Urwa, and that is that it's really on their authority that they are being presented as authentic. Now, th there are scholars today, today who take this seriously. And uh, Gregor Scholler is an Islamic scholar who actually wrote, I discuss him in the book, about how it's very exciting that we have these traditions from Urwa ibn Azubair because he was Aisha's nephew. And so he probably sat at his aunt's feet and heard her tell stories about Muhammad and early Islam. Okay. The, here again, this is a big sleight of hand. This is a big trick on the part of Islamic tradition because we don't know anything about what Urwa ibn Azubair said except in ninth century material. It doesn't come from 30, 40 years after Muhammad as if it were a contemporary record written down by uh, uh, Aisha's nephew. It comes from 200 years later when somebody says this comes from Aisha's nephew. Well, that's great. I happen to have a letter right here that Thomas Jefferson's nephew wrote me. <laughs> and I guarantee you, Barry, that it's authentic. <laughs> and, and keep in mind, 200 years in those days is a multitude of generations because people didn't live 70 and 80 years. They lived sometimes 30 years. So one century might be three generations. Three centuries might be 10 generations. And there wasn't a lot of stuff written down. It was orally, traditionally passed down. My goodness how the story could have changed, yeah? And that's another thing that uh, people say, well, see, it's oral tradition. You're looking for written records. And this was an oral culture. Great, okay, okay. It, I know that there are tremendous feats of memory that people have uh, demonstrated. Like for example, uh, Homer's Odyssey and Iliad. We have manuscripts of them, as far as I recall, from the 800s AD, which is probably over a thousand years after Homer. And so there's, in the first place, it's possible that there's a whole lot of elaboration, but it's also likely that people were memorizing this material and repeating it. That's great. Uh, there are several problems, however. One is that in the case of Homer, as in the case of Islam and Muhammad, 
there's every possibility that somebody might not have total recall. That while there may be uh, Homer's Odyssey and the text is fixed in this tradition, there might be some other copy somewhere else where some of the words are changed. This is only to be expected because you're dealing with human memory. And in the case of Islam, you have not only do we have to believe that all these people who transmitted these traditions had absolutely total recall, perfect recollection of everything that happened, but also the, the uh, authenticity of various traditions of Muhammad is established on the basis of the chain of transmitters. That is, Aisha told Urwa, told so-and-so, told so-and-so, told so-and-so. And if all those people are considered to be reliable and trustworthy, then the ninth century Hadith scholars considered it to be an authentic tradition. But they were dealing, they themselves admitted that thousands, tens of thousands of the stories of Muhammad had been forged for various purposes. That people of a certain group would forge a story of Muhammad to support their view, and then the other group would make a story of Muhammad to support their view, and so on. Okay, so if you can forge a story of Muhammad, you're telling me you can't forge a chain of transmitters that's full of reliable people? And also the earliest traditions don't have the chains of transmitters. So the whole thing, there may be some historically accurate material in it, but there's no way for us to tell what it is. And there's so much room for legendary elaboration that none of it ultimately can be considered trustworthy. Robert, these are groundbreaking claims. I mean, earth shattering, move the earth kind of claims. Where can people find out more about your work? Well, I'm at jihadwatch.org and at uh, the uh, Jihad Watch RS on Twitter, and there's a Jihad Watch site on Facebook. The books are available at Amazon, at Barnes & Noble. All this uh, may not be true tomorrow, Barry, because the uh, Global Institute for Counterterrorism, or whatever it's called, has, which is run by fake Facebook, Microsoft, YouTube, uh, Twitter, they've decided, they've classified me as a violent extremist, which is plain libel. But in any case, I could be gone tomorrow, get the books today. Well, you don't look that violent to me, uh, <laughs> if anyone cares about my opinion. So um, I appreciate you coming on today. And like I said, this is groundbreaking stuff. I want to remind our viewers, if you haven't done it yet, subscribe now. You'll get all of Robert Spencer on ATP in the palm of your hand absolutely for free. All you got to do is text the word truth to 88202. For ATP Report, thanks for joining us today. I'm Barry Newsbaum.